people want to believe that there exists somewhere in the universe an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization. Keep it real high. Now, does anybody actually you want to believe but think that doesn't actually exist? A lot of people think it doesn't exist. Okay. So it's a really interesting question, right? I mean, when you phrase it like this, is there another Earth out there? Because that's really cool, right? Because it's a whole other place to visit. They have food, culture, all kinds of interesting things, different languages, people. And that would be amazing, right? That would be amazing. Um, it could be really bad, too. Um, and we have searched extensively in our solar system. We clearly do not have intelligent life outside of the Earth. We search extensively for microbial life, plant life maybe, in places in the solar system, and we have yet to find anything. There are hints that maybe there's stuff. Um, Mars, for example, has, it's been known for a while, to have a very thin haze of methane that surrounds it. And that's odd because methane by itself is not a gas that can be easily retained in the atmosphere which means it must have a constant source. It's must, Mars' atmosphere must be fed methane by something. And one of the best, easiest ways to do that is if you have life, if you have cows on the surface. But any kind of microbial life would release methane as a byproduct. So that's a suggestion there. The depths of uh, Europa, it's a moon of Jupiter. We believe that underneath the ice of Europa, there are oceans and uh, possibly life that would exist down in the oceans. We know that in our own planet, at the depths of the oceans, there is life that exists that does not live off the sun. It did not work on photosynthesis. If the sun were to disappear, that life would continue to thrive. And that means if there's other locations, and Europe is the best candidate for that, where there is liquid water, and there's a heat source because the tidal pumping from Jupiter, the tides produce heat, that you could have life that lives down there. And so there's been a mission proposed several times that it, it kind of comes up and fails, comes, comes up and fails in terms of getting funded. But there's a mission to drill through the ice of Europa, send a submersible to search around and look for life. But we, again, we don't expect it to be very smart life, basically. So the other thing we have to do is we have to look out into space. We have to try to communicate with something. And the way we've gone about it in the last few decades is to use radio communication. Radio communication is good for a lot of reasons. One, it doesn't require as much power to produce radio waves and shoot them into space. It's the lowest energy electromagnetic radiation there is. So you can create a very powerful signal with not a lot of energy. So you could get to deep space, basically, by shooting radio waves in there. Also, there's a lot of regions of the radio spectrum where it is quiet, Meaning there isn't other space, there isn't other sources of that radio emission in the galaxy. So it's a good frequency to, to call on. So how do we do it? The question is, if you're going to send a signal out, how would you do that in a way that would be interpreted? Well, the way that we've decided to do that, and this is mostly done by the work of SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the way they've gone about doing this is to send out a signal, a basically on-off signal, zeros and ones, a binary code. And the idea is you send out a binary code that is a string of numbers that has two prime factors. This message here is a message of 35 characters, ones and zeros, sent out repeatedly. And the idea is that you take the string of 35 characters and because they have two factors to them, you could break that signal down into two things. You can create a five by seven grid of that signal, which is this, and this is nonsense, or a five by seven, a seven by five signal, which would create a picture of a person, which would probably be recognizable as a pattern. And uh, so we've decided to do something that's basically like this. There is a telescope, a very powerful radio telescope in Puerto Rico uh, at the Arecibo Observatory. And it's called the Arecibo Message. 
And what it is is we send out uh, 1,679 pulses of ones and zeros. Now, 1,679 pulses have two prime factors, 23 and 73. That means you can only arrange those ones and zeros into, there's only two ways you can arrange it. You can do a 32 by 73 grid or a 73 by 32 grid. One of the ways you arrange it produces this pattern here. This pattern it tries to communicate some basic ideas of what, of where the signal comes from. Down here shows the transmission signal, how it was sent out. There's some information about our solar system, what we're like, DNA structure, some basic ideas of, of uh, how DNA and some proteins are put together, our number system, and so on. The hope is that somebody smart enough gets the signal, recognizes it to be not a natural signal, realizes that it's made up of this many pulses, arranges them in the right way, and can read our message. So that's the hope. And we've shot that out. And I think at the moment, we're talking about maybe 30 or 40 light years away could get the signal. And then, of course, there's the return trip if they want to talk back to us. And so we are listening and we are talking. And uh, that's the best we can do because travel is obviously a very difficult issue. Okay, is there any questions about this message? Yes. Because we want to talk to somebody that's very smart. We, are, we have to, that's all we can do. We don't want to talk to somebody that is as intelligent or less intelligent than us because that communication is too difficult. Yes. Yes. Because they would be able to interpret this signal. If so we, basically, if we, can, if we shot out a signal and it was Earth 500 years ago, they would not be able to read this message. But we don't want to communicate with an Earth that's 500 years old. We're trying to communicate with extraterrestrial intelligence, smarter, as smart, or smarter than us. And that's what we're shooting for. Because there really isn't going to be a benefit Ultimately, I mean, it's interesting to find a planet that has primitive humans on it or primitive aliens or maybe a planet of just animals, but you're not going to communicate with them. It's no, it's, I mean, we'll, we'll see that they're there and we'll say, that's neat, but we're shooting high. It's not a lot of effort to do this. And so we're shooting high because imagine this. If we have the ability to send out signals and we send out really primitive messages... They're not going to talk back. There's a good chance they would they'd not find any uh, benefit in, in communicating back with us. So we're trying to shoot high. That's the idea. We're trying to communicate with somebody, hopefully far more intelligent than us. That's the idea. Now, the issue with that, there's a lot of issues with that. One of the issues is if there does exist extremely intelligent civilizations out there, far more intelligent than primitive Earth, relatively speaking, then this may not matter at all because they hear the signal and it's like a cricket, you know, outside. I don't go outside and talk to the crickets or try to communicate the crickets. I just hear them. They're annoying. Well, this could be annoying. Right? So it's a something. It's an attempt. It's a tr it, we're trying something. Uh, I mentioned here the radio communications. There's a small region in the in centimeter wavelengths called the water hole. It's a place where there is not a lot of noise from the galaxy. And it happens to be a region between two um, absorption bands that come from the water molecule. The idea, again, if we have an intelligent civil civilization, they would know about the water hole. They'd know that it was a place that would be a good place to send out communication. They would be listening there. So we send out the communications in that fashion. Obviously, so far, we don't have any evidence for any extraterrestrial life. We haven't heard anything and we haven't received any signals back. So there's been a lot of speculation as to how many there would be out there, if any at all. And a lot of the speculation comes in the form of something called the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation is, was created by an astronomer that's at Santa Cruz, his name is Frank Drake. And he created an equation that's a set of probabilities. And the equation looks something like this. Now, there's many different modified forms of this, but this is sort of the original form of it. What the equation is, 
The equation starts off with the number of stars that are located in our galaxy, and it modifies that number with various factors. <clears throat> and the point of the equation is try to estimate how many intelligent civilizations exist in our galaxy that have the ability to send and receive uh, intelligent communication. So the idea is it's kind of a thought experiment. Play around with these numbers and see if we can come up with an interesting estimate. And so there are different sort of pessimistic and optimistic views on these numbers. And some of these numbers are known very well. Some of these numbers we didn't know 10, 20 years ago, and we know them today. And likely, as we get further and further into the future, we'll be able to narrow some of these other numbers down, and maybe we'll be able to come up with not just a probability, we'll be able to know with some high certainty what the likelihood really is. As you go down the list here, these become less certain. Now, we've, pre we've known for a while now how many stars are in our galaxy. That's pretty well set. There's no difference in the pessimistic, optimistic view in that. But there is a limitation automatically placed on this. We are making the assumption that an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization lives around a star. That could be wrong. Okay, but we're starting with that. The next thing on here is the fractions of stars with planets. That's a number that we really know now, that we didn't know 20 years ago. In fact, both these numbers are very much wrong now. We believe that the number of planets around stars are close very close to one, that almost every star has planets around them. The actual number is probably like 0.98 or something like that. But it's a number we really know. Number of planets per star that lie in the life zone for longer than 4 billion years. Now again, optimistic, pessimistic view, one in 100 or just one. This is a number that we're beginning to know right now because of Kepler, the Kepler mission. And given another 10 years, we will absolutely be able to nail down this fraction. We will know exactly what it is. And currently, it's close to a half. But we have low numbers to work with here. But the pessimistic view is clearly wrong. We are closer to the optimistic view as far as how many plants live in the life zone. And then as you start to get further down, some of these fractions become really unknown. And this could become pure speculation. How many of these planets have life that begins? No clue. We have no idea how many have life or what the probability is to make life. How many evolve to intelligence? how many develop technology, how many can actually communicate. And there's actually other factors you can come up with. There's a factor that's added in here as to what percentage of civilizations kill themselves, basically, through whatever, war, pollution, things like that. But it's a nice little exercise to go through and try to come up with your own estimates for these things. But given the, some very pessimistic or, or optimistic views, you get some pretty wide variant numbers here. The optimistic view states that there are 10 million intelligent civilizations in the galaxy. The pessimistic view would say that the likelihood is like one in you know, 200,000, which would be very unlikely. What's interesting about that pessimistic view, though, is that while that would occur for our galaxy, we have hundreds of billions of galaxies. So take that into account, you're coming up with still millions of civilizations in the entire universe. So the pessimistic view still would say that there's a lot of stuff. Okay? So the question is really out there, a lot of stuff's uncertain, but um, there is basically only one fact that we can work with. There's only one fact that we can say with certainty about intelligent life. Okay. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to present an argument to you. This is based on a series of essays that were written on this topic here. Um, part of what I'm talking about here is been termed the Fermi paradox, okay? And it's a growing belief in the scientific community that we live in a universe where there is no other intelligent life other than us. Because the more we search, the less and less that we come up with any answers to things. We have no evidence that things exist outside of the earth. And so, the paradox is basically this, you know, we're here, nobody else is here, that's an odd thing. Now, the fact that I was talking about here is this. The only fact that you can really talk about is that there is no intelligent extraterrestrials on Earth now or really in the past. We have no evidence for their existence on Earth, outside of Earth, and 
that requires an explanation. It's really the only fact you can work with here. Okay, an explanation for this fact goes as the following. If they did exist, they would have eventually achieved space travel. They would have explored and colonized the galaxy. They would have eventually reached the Earth. However, the above fact holds, and therefore they do not exist. So that's what I'm presenting to you as an explanation for the only fact that we have regarding extraterrestrials. Now, there could be other explanations. What do you think? Give me some. Do you think there's other explanations? Yes. Oh, so they did come. So that would be a conspiracy theory, basically. Okay. That is that is an alternative explanation. And we'll have to explore that. We will explore that idea, actually. Any other ideas? Could anything else explain? Yes, Jacqueline. Okay, so they're out there. They haven't reached us yet. It's a matter of time, you're saying, basically? Lucy? Okay, so that's more of a, uh, I guess what we would say, that's kind of like a sociological explanation. There's just a lack, a lack of motivation maybe, or a fear. A fear makes sense because a fear would explain why they're not here and why they don't have their, they don't reveal their presence. I mean, I kind of get that because, you know, Say you're an extraterrestrial and you're traveling towards Earth, I'm going to meet these people. And then you start to receive some of the radio signals and you watch a movie like District 9. You're like, wait a minute, let's turn this around. I'm not going to be imprisoned. I don't think so. I mean, honestly, if you look at the way we depict aliens typically in movies, especially big, big blockbuster movies, it's not generally good. They're either really weird or dangerous, whether it's malicious or an accident. Yeah, we're not, a, or, or, yes. <laughs> well, that's, you're all about the conspiracies here. That's great. I mean, that is another explanation that they are here. They visited in the past. I mean, that's actually an explanation that, I mean, I don't think any serious astronomers put forth, but a lot of, you know, people a little out there. Historically, there's a belief that there are ancient aliens, which is the, that show, right? Ancient aliens. And so they believe that, I, you know, certain, the certain uh, engineering feats that have occurred on Earth that believe would not be possible. The, you know, the creation of the pyramids, um, Stonehenge, things like that. And... Uh, there's a lot of like historical writings too. I mean, like there's actually a really weird passage. It's in Genesis. It's like chapter 15 or 16 about the Nephilim. In the Bible, there's a chapter about this, these creatures called the Nephilim that lived with humans. They were giant creatures. I think they flew. What's up with that? Like that's like never mentioned, but like the Bible says that there were other life forms on the earth that were bigger than human, they actually mated with humans, and then they're not here anymore. So what's up with that? Like, so that's the people say, well, that's evidence that there were aliens here and they're gone, and there's biblical evidence for it. That one gets me. Thor is Thor is. <laughs> All right, so I want to do is I'm gonna go through some of the more popular arguments as to why they don't exist here and shoot them down, okay? Now, feel free to speak up and comment and, and, and question. So uh, I'm going to basically talk about four different explanations. Now, these are not the only ones, but they're probably the most plausible ones. Physical explanation is basically they want to be here, but they cannot be here due to some physical limitation. Sociological explanation is they don't want to be here. They could be here. Tempo explanation is they're coming, we have to be patient, and then UFO explanation is basically the conspiracies. All right, so let's get into this. Now, the way I'm going to present the physical argument is that there's basically some kind of impossibility, whether it's a physical impossibility, a technological impossibility, whatever. 
But the way I'm actually going to discuss this is if we, we try to achieve space travel and how possible it would be for us. And I don't think it's actually that difficult for us to achieve space travel. And if that's the case, that it wouldn't be hard for a more intelligent civilization to achieve space travel. The problem with space travel today, the reason why we don't travel to other stars, the only reason really, is because it takes too long. It takes too long to go to other stars. The distances are very large. And the fastest spacecraft we have, the fastest spacecraft is the New Horizons spacecraft. And I believe that goes something like close to 100,000 kilometers an hour. Could be totally wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's the number. And uh, at those speeds, like Voyager spacecraft is a little bit slower than that. If you want to go on a, on a round weight, a round trip to Alpha Centauri, the closest star that we know of, it would take tens of thousands of years. So that's not a viable option, obviously. We could go faster than this. The fastest we could reasonably go in a spacecraft is 10% the speed of light. You don't want to go faster than 10% of the speed of light, though. If you go at 10% the speed of light, a round trip to Alpha Centauri would take 86 years. Not too bad. Round trip. Round trip. Yes. We really got to teach the babies, but yeah, sure. Okay. Now, you don't want to go faster than 10% of the speed of light because there's two issues with that. There's major time dilation effects. In relativity, one of the, uh, one of the sort of pillars of relativity is a, a principle called time dilation. When an observer travels very fast relative to a stationary observer, the person that travels very fast, time slows down for them. So when they return back, if they travel too fast, the Earth would have aged a lot, and they would not have. Okay, You saw interstellar. That principle existed there. They went to the planet, and that was actually due to a large gravitational effect, which happens the same way. The large gravitational effect produced a time dilation, which made those people age very slowly. So when they came back, somehow that guy was still alive on the ship, and he was just like, where were you? And, uh, and so that was really sad. Anyway, that was really bad acting, by the way, when I saw that. The guy's like, I have to be, I have to act sad. So he's just like, and the whole time he's just quiet. It's like, no, that guy would have blown his brains out. Or just left. No way it would have... I think, what was it, like 70 years or something crazy? I don't know. what. Anyway, whatever. So problem is obviously not trivial. Oh, by the way, you also don't want to travel too fast because if you travel too fast, then anything in the way is going to destroy your ship pretty, pretty much. Because the faster and faster you travel, debris that just sits there approaches you at that speed. So if there's a rock, I mean, if there's just like a pebble in space, it's going to approach your spaceship at some percentage of the speed of light. That's basically a gamma ray. And gamma ray is going to wipe your ship out. So if you travel too fast, you have to worry about things being in the way, unless you have the ability to somehow, you know, that's hard to do. N not really. I mean, that's a possibility, but there's a good, pretty good likelihood it's going to hit you still. I mean, it's possible what you're saying, but, but there's a lot of stuff. All right, so... How could we get over the fact that the trip takes way too long? And so x are going to have to deal with this too, in addition to us. There's a lot of ways we can go about this. Now, I'm going to give you the, the one that's probably the most far-fetched. The most far-fetched one currently is biological animation suspension. The whole idea is you freeze yourself. Okay. Yeah. So like the whole Fallout, you guys playing Fallout 4. Okay. The guy throws the guy for 200 years and he's totally fine. Yeah, well, if now there is something to the fact that if you do, you know, not really freeze yourself, but if you lower the temperature of the body, you slow down all of your, your circulatory system, metabolic system, nervous system, all slows down, which effectively is slowing down time for you. You would age slower. That is a fact. Now, can you do it enough so it's significant and not have any great harm to yourself? That question's up in the air. It's not entirely clear that that can be done. So, let's try. Well, so future biological advances could figure out how we do this. We go in there, we freeze ourselves, we go on a trip for 50 years, we come out, and we only aged a year or so, basically. Um, that's been a pretty popular in sci fi. The alien movies worked on this principle they freeze themselves. Star Trek had things like that. That's a really popular idea. But it's based on some facts, actually. Now, 
So maybe extraterrestrials figure this out, or maybe extraterrestrials actually have totally different biological systems to make that process easier, or they just don't age like we do, or they have lifespans that are much longer. Okay, lifespan of a human, you know, I think average life expectancy of a human right now is in the upper 70s. Some people live to 100, though. That's about how long people live for. We don't live much longer than that. But things live longer than that, right? There are trees that live longer than that. There are tortoises that, that live 200 years or something. There was a tortoise, tortoise that died, uh, I think, a few years ago that had been alive since the Civil War. Okay. Yeah, so maybe when the spaceship lands outside and a turtle comes out and talks to us. So, I mean, it's very... Now, obviously, one of the things that's happened with, with, with humans is that with a lot of advances we have in, in medicine and health, we've extended the life expectancy. It's the best it's ever been. And what's possible is an evolutionary effect, that because we live longer, one of the problems with that is we experience far more illnesses as a result. Okay, we artificially extend our lives. Um, I mean, like I'm, I mean, I'm, so what that could do is that could result in evolutionary effect. We could learn to adapt to a lot of the problems we create ourselves. Okay, being able to adapt to a lot of cancer, a lot of diseases that we have, and this, from an evolutionary standpoint, we may actually start to evolve towards longer lifespans as a result of this. That's an evolutionary argument. So that's possible. Now, aliens could have different lifespans, right? Other ways to go about it. So I think the reality of saying, I'm going to get a spaceship and go to another star and come back, it's, it's pretty much out of the question, unless we have some kind of inconceivable discovery in physics you know, that, that says we can do something like that. But the other ways to go about this is to send people with robots. The robots control the spaceship. You send out basically frozen embryos. And you hatch kids or something like that. You just hatch humans. You have a hundred year space flight. And, you know, in the last, you know, 20 years, the robots had to hatch the people. They raise little babies. And when they get to 20 years old, they're trained and, and educated by the robots and they reach their destination. And that's the people that are going to communicate. Yeah, you know, they're not even, they're not, they're not actually earthlings. <laughs> they're just, they're human, but they're not from Earth. So that's a kind of an out there one. But the idea of having robots do the work, entirely or partially with humans is a possibility. Um, a good one is having a multi-generational space flight. The idea is you go out, but you will not make it. You will die on the way. But you'll have kids. Who will have kids? Who will have kids? And some future generation will eventually make it. And as long as you have the ability to bring enough fuel and bring enough food and collect things along the way, you potentially could create a system like that where you live on the spaceship and you die on the spaceship. So that's, I mean, honestly, this is one of the more easier things to do. You send out people knowing they will die on the way. Well, you're going to have to figure out a way. You have to have a very diverse population of people. And so, yeah, you don't want to send out, you know, the same family. I have a problem with it. Yeah. All right. Now, um, how could we now actually send in a spaceship out to a distant star is technologically not very difficult. We have the technology today to do this, by the way. If we wanted to send a spacecraft at 10% of the speed of light, we could absolutely do it. Okay. Now, you'd have to, what we would likely do is we'd have a spacecraft, we would build it in space. Okay, we have a space station up, we build it in space, and you can make a little argument here. You wouldn't use chemical fuel that has a very low efficiency. Nuclear fuel has good efficiency. Okay, so you were talking about nuclear reactors that power this thing. Nuclear reactors can have efficiencies upwards of 30, 40, 50%. Really good efficiencies. So you could extract a lot of energy from nuclear reactions. And you could actually work out what kind of energy you need to go 10% the speed of light, and you can calculate how much nuclear fusion you would need to do this. And with a fusion efficiency rate of 30%, you would need to have a spaceship that contains nine to 10 times its mass in fuel. And you could make the spaceship reach the speed of light. Now, I believe this is a one-way trip. Okay. Now, 
making a space trip travel very fast is very easy because unlike the Earth here, when a when a when a, a, a airplane goes up and flies, it has to provide constant thrust because there's air resistance that tries to slow it down. In space, you don't have the resistance, so all you need to do is speed it up to top speed and slow it down. That's all you need. So getting something up to 10% the speed of light is just a matter of time and fuel. And when you do the numbers here, I'm not going to go into the details of the calculation, but you only need nine to 10 times its mass in fuel. Not, not actually hard to do. And you can potentially collect mass when you're out there. Okay? There's ideas of having these giant cones on the front of spaceships that collect interstellar matter, and that becomes a nuclear fuel. So that's not really that far-fetched. And this technology basically exists today, and so creating a spaceship to do this is not really an issue for us, and it wouldn't be an issue for aliens. Okay. There's a lot of unknowns, though. So one of the problems is, now this is the International Space Station, and there is questions as to how long you could be in space for. Now, weightlessness will be an issue. Astronauts have serious issues being in space weightless for extended periods of time. In fact, when astronauts are up in space, they have to spend a significant amount of time every day exercising. Because if you don't, your muscles atrophy. You don't use them, you lose them. So you have to be able to keep up your biological system. So there's a lot of exercise that has to go into it. Now, one thing we could do is create a spaceship that has the ability to reproduce gravity. Okay, saw it in the Martian, saw it in Interstellar, saw it in 2001. Uh, that technology is not far-fetched. A centrifuge, a spin-in, a rotating spacecraft would produce an artificial gravity that would be identical to what we have on Earth here. So a rotating spacecraft could take care of a lot of the weightlessness, but being in space for extended periods of time, you just have different, this is a different environment, okay? There's a lot of things that we're not shielded. We're shielded from cosmic rays on Earth. In space, the shielding's not as good. So you basically have a greater amount of radiation that you would encounter, and that's a problem. Um, you know, once we get into deep space, we don't know what's out there exactly. We know there's interstellar dust and gas, but we don't know to what extent. Uh, would we run into an object and explode? I mean, it could be a real possibility that traveling from one star to the next, there's a lot of things in the way that could potentially cause problems. So uh, until we've actually done it, we won't truly know what all the unpredictable dangers are, but it could be an issue. It could be an issue. But the actual space travel itself doesn't seem to be an insurmountable thing. So stating that there are extraterrestrials and they're just stuck on their planets doesn't seem like a good argument, especially if there's a lot of them, because if they're stuck there, they're going to be screaming out in the space, saying, we're here, we're here, we're here, help us. And that does not happen. We do not see those signals. I mean, because honestly, if you think about it, if there really was an impossibility to space travel and there were tons of intelligent extraterrestrials out there, they would be sending, we would do that. We would send signals out all the time. We're, we are here, we can't get away. And we would see those signals and we don't see those signals. All right. all right. That was the physical explanation. Let's talk about some sociological explanations. The premise here, the extraterrestrials could visit, but they don't want to for whatever reason. So the idea here is basically, the main idea is something we call the anthropomorphic view. Anthropomorphic view means they're like humans, okay? If you make the assumption that they're like humans, that could be a problem. They may not be like humans. They may not be motivated like we are or have the same desires or curiosity that we do. And that would explain probably some of these things. One of them is called contemplation hypothesis. Now, the picture on the right is humanity in a nutshell, okay? History... I mean, I could sum up history for you very easily. Hey, that's a nice piece of land you have over there. I'm going to take it. No, you're not. Okay, we'll fight. I won. I got your land. I mean, most of history revolves around taking things and claiming stuff. We love placing flags down on things. On the North Pole, at the bottom of the ocean, you know how many flags are there? Many. Many flags at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean because different nations have claimed tiny slices of the Arctic Pole by placing a flag down at the bottom of the ocean. Not joking. No, not Antarctica. Arctic. The Arctic. 
But Antarctica is the same thing. If you look at a map of Antarctica, it's been, it's like pie slices. Different countries have sliced out their sections. Why? Well, yeah, but why do we do it? That's just our nature. We do that. Our nature is to be curious, okay? Okay, we are curious. We are aggressive in nature. That's history. It's not an opinion. That's just historical fact. Aggression exists all throughout history. Curiosity exists all throughout history as well. So um, now that's what we're like. Are other civilizations like that as well? And what if you have a planet that's made up of people that just like to chill out? And they don't care about science. They don't care about flying or space travel. They see the stars, but they're like, whatever. I don't care about stars. And they would have no motivation to communicate. They wouldn't even care. Um, so the idea is that they're not like us. However, it would be strange to believe that every civilization is not like us, that we're somehow odd in, in, our, in our desire to explore and to conquer. So we would think that's got to be some, right? And that would ruin the party for everybody else. Because if you live in a universe where 1% of the population is the conquering type, then the others are going to have problems, right? So. But they lived in a world with others that were not like them. And that's the problem. So that's what I'm saying is that like, there are examples of civilizations on the earth that do deviate to some extent culturally from that kind of nature. But that, 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 that they're not the ones you hear about throughout history. That could, no, you, well, you could put that. You absolutely could. The Drake equation is, 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 is meant to be modified and adjusted to, to, your, to anybody's ideas, right? You could put that in there as, as an aspect. Yes, absolutely. But there's obviously the one huge problem with that is that if you live in a world where a few civilizations are aggressive and curious and they like to explore, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem, right? All right, so... Another sociological uh, explanation would be a sort of a, a, a political argument, basically. And the idea is that it's like, a, it's kind of, I mean, I show a Star Wars picture, but actually a Star Trek picture might be more appropriate because in Star Trek, they have a system of no contact. And the system of no contact exists for many reasons, but one could be there is a government system, a universal or galactic government system that prevents contact. And there could be various reasons for that. Um, and I'll go into some of those reasons. But um, if there's guidelines establishing no contact, uh, the problem with that is they would have to hide their existence and there would have to be no rebellion against that system. Okay, even in Star Trek, they screw that up all the time. It's like a joke. They, they have no contact policy, but they're constantly like making themselves known all over the place. So. Uh, you know, that would be hard to follow. So it'd have to be a mass conspiracy if a galactic system already exists and it's being hidden from us. Now, why would they do something like that? Well, well, there's a lot of reasons. One, um, well, let's see here. One could be what I would refer to as a tough love approach where it wouldn't be beneficial to us if there was an advanced civilization that came down today onto Earth and said, hey, guess what? We figured out all the secrets of the universe. We have amazing energy uh, sources. We've come up with fast computing power, flying machines, PlayStation 200, whatever. And here's the technology. Here you go. Because that would not be really beneficial to us, right? You go back a thousand years. Okay? And think about the technology we have today and just hand it over to people who lived a thousand years ago. Okay? How would that go over? Well, they don't understand the technology. They have no way to appreciate it and very likely will result in some serious problems. It would be abused and misunderstood and 
Um, in fact, they probably would think it's evil, magic, something like that. It, 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 it would might be very difficult to do something like that. Another reason is it could be a test. Now, it could be sort of like an evolutionary test. Civilizations pop up all the time. And some civilizations are toxic. And some civilizations evolve out of that. Some civilizations learn how to live with themselves and live with their planet and conserve and not pollute. And if they make it through that, then they're worthy of contact. But a lot of civilizations may wipe themselves out because there's something inherently wrong with them. Okay, there's something genetically wrong with humans and that we are not really built to survive. And so it could be a test. Yeah, that's an idea. It could be a test. And when we reach the point where we've learned to live properly and, 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 and not pollute our planet and all the you know, hippie stuff that everybody loves, you know, whatever, then, yeah, then, we're, then we're worthy of contact. It could set up a lot of things. But the basic premise is no contact because there's some sort of test or something has to happen for us to receive contact. Um, there's a self-destruction hypothesis, which is very, which is a, a possibility, but it, it basically states that there is maybe a flaw with, with civilizations that they grow too fast and they kill themselves off. And so we've come many times close to serious problems. We've had, you know, problems with, with the Cold War and nuclear missiles. We have various pollution issues. Global warming is a big deal right now. And uh, ozone layer was a big deal in the 80s and 90s. And we fixed that to some extent. The hole has shrunk in size and so on. But it's possible that a lot of civilizations kill themselves off so they don't get to a point where they can establish contact. But again, does every single civilization kill themselves off? That would be hard to believe. There is something called the zoo hypothesis. And the zoo hypothesis states that Intelligent civilizations are far more advanced than us to the point where there is no benefit to communicating with us. Okay, like I said, I mentioned the cricket earlier, okay, or, or going outside and seeing a colony of ants. You ever stop, get down on the ground, and start to try to have a conversation? Even if you did, is there any benefit you'd really get out of that? You'd get bored real fast. Maybe if you're, you know... A scientist that study those life forms and maybe that's kind of just gets you excited but generally speaking that's not something that we really care about so it's possible that we are considered very primitive and and we either could be kept as a no contact uh because we're a wildlife preserve we just nobody's supposed to contact us because we're so pristine and primitive we do that actually this, this is a un, this is a uncontacted tribe. I think this was in South America, where we're not doing a good job of no contact here because they're trying to shoot us down or something. But we've done that. We've we've decided that there are certain in fact there's this uh there's an island. I believe the island is somewhere in the South Pacific near Asia. I think I actually want to say it's off the coast of India, where there's a civilization that lives there. And we have not contacted them. They know that other people exist. And uh, there's been some sort of nasty interactions that have happened. This, there, was a, there were these two fishermen that their boat was, they were stranded. And their boat floated to this island. And when they got there, the people there just murdered them. And there was a, I saw a video of a ship that approached. And the people came out and got angry. And they were yelling and screaming and throwing things. And... And as far as I know, I mean, unless something's happened recently, we have not landed on that island. That's an island that is cut off from the rest of the earth. And people live there, and we leave them alone. So we've done this. This is something that humans have done, actually. So it's possible that all the civilizations do this as well. The problem with this idea, though, is that the crickets, the ants, those people on that island, they know that there's others. They know that there's other people. Um, and so that's the problem here, is that if this is true... We don't see any evidence for this, though. We don't see that there. We there's be out, people out there, and they just don't contact us. So, anyway, we could be too dangerous and so on. But a lot of the sociological ideas, the problem with them, is that there are always exceptions, and um, uh, so those are always exceptions. And what's the other point I was going to make? Ugh, just had it. 
I don't know. Something I said earlier that I can't remember now. Okay. All right. Questions about any of this stuff here? No contact. Yes. Rule. Yes. <laughs> Actually, yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, I am firmly of the belief that there are no intelligent extraterrestrial life in the galaxy. And if there is an explanation, I think it basically falls under a zoo hypothesis that there is, but they purposely hide themselves because they're taking a tough love approach to Earth. Are we worthy of contact? And I think there's something to the fact that there may be, from an evolutionary standpoint, certain civilizations that are, basically it's like a survival of the fittest. I mean, there are lots of, I mean, that's how evolution works. Survival of the fittest, certain species make it, certain don't, because from an evolutionary standpoint, they have the ability to survive. So it could be a test. Certain civilizations are, are created they evolve, but they're toxic. There's something inherently wrong with them. And that sucks. That sounds horrible, but that's possible that they're waiting to see, are we worthy of contact? Are we going to be, you know, cause I mean, like I said, our alien movies are mostly like explosions and guns and killing stuff. And that's not a very attractive thing if you want to contact us. So, all right. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Dude. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. All right, temporal explanation. Um, I believe that the temporal explanation is the weakest of all these arguments. And the argument basically is this, that they're here, they're out there, but we have yet to hear from them. Okay, so the problem with this really boils down to this idea that the solar system basically popped up approximately 9 billion years after the Big Bang. And it took 4.5 billion years for evolution to get us to this point. Okay? That doesn't really appear to be anything special about those periods of time. It's certainly possible that our solar system could have come up a billion years prior and we have the same situations we have today. There's no reason in particular it took 4.5 billion years for everything to happen here. In fact, it probably would have been faster if it wasn't for a series of mass extinctions. They believe there's been four or five mass extinctions in the history of the Earth. If those mass extinctions didn't exist, would we have showed up here faster? There doesn't appear to be anything special about 13.7 billion years for humans to pop up or any intelligent civilization to pop up. So the question really is this. Assume that we decided to embark on a program of space exploration. How long does it take, would it take, for us to explore and colonize the galaxy? Now this assumes that we become like, you know, gung-ho, robotic in you know, our determination and just full steam towards doing this. Well, <clears throat> we already established that we would probably want to travel at 10% the speed of light, which we can do. And this is how we would go about it. This was, again, this was, based on a, on a, this was based on a conference where a bunch of astronomers got together and said, hey, let's come up with a plan for galactic colonization. And this is how a lot of experts in the field decided how it should go down. We would build 100 spaceships. And the 100 spaceships would have enough supplies and people to make it to the 100 closest stars to our solar system. They go out. Now, the 100 closest stars, you would get there within a matter of a few decades. Okay, I think uh, 100 closest stars, you're definitely going to reach all of them by 80 years. No more than 80 years. Many of them sooner. The closest one's 43 years. And then you go from there and, and, and you're probably only going to have a, like maybe 70, 80 years for the furthest one. So you send the ships out. The ships arrive at the destination and they hope 
that there's a place to land, a place to mine, a place to get resources, a place to establish a colony. Some will, some won't. Some spaceships will get there and they realize that there's a star here with just a whole bunch of just useless asteroids and no planets. And they show up and they realize, okay, well, we're all going to die and something we can do about it, so we're just dead. Okay. But what happens is this. The 100 reach there. A lot of them probably find suitable places to live, whether it's an Earth-like planet or something they could establish a colony on, whether it's like underground or something like that. And they land on there. They spend a bit of time producing 100 more spaceships. By that time, you've had several generations of people. So you might have you know, increased your population by a factor of 8, 16, or so on. So you have a lot more people. You establish a colony, and the goal is to create 100 more spaceships. And the 100 spaceships, which would take a matter of, you know, maybe a few years to create 100 more spaceships, and then those spaceships go out to the 100 nearest stars. Now, when I say 100 nearest stars, I don't mean the 100 nearest stars in one direction. I mean literally the 100 nearest stars. So that means when all these spaceships get there, there are potentially 100 spaceships coming back to Earth. Okay, you would go to the literally 100 nearest stars. And the reason you do that is for redundancy. If a spaceship doesn't make it because something happened on the way, other spaceships would reach there. And so every star would actually have tons of spaceships that would eventually reach there over the course of a century. So you repeat this process. You just send out 100 spaceships, colonize, rinse and repeat over and over and over again. You have a brief pause between trips, a few years as it takes to colonize, mine, create new spaceships. Okay? Now, a lot of people wouldn't make it. The trip there, you may not make it. You may get to the star, you don't make it. Okay. But I'm talking about like this insane like determination that we somehow have to have to do this. If you did that, if we could be like robots and do this, then the frontier of space exploration would be an expanding sphere where the surface would expand at basically 10% the speed of light. Maybe a little bit slower because you have to account for the fact you're taking pauses. But imagine from the Earth, a sphere that expands at 10% the speed of light. If you would go at that speed to cover the entire galaxy and go back would take less than 2 million years. Okay? Most of the galaxy is covered in under a million years. Round trip would be another one of those. So it's very likely that a civilization that's completely devoted to colonizing the entire galaxy could do so in under 2 million years. Okay? We'll call that a time unit. Okay? The universe has been around for 13.7 billion years. So the moment that there's a civilization that could come up and do something like this, they would do it in a very small fraction of time. Okay? Basically, 5,000 time units have passed since the Big Bang. And it only takes one time unit to do this whole thing. So the question would have to become, why would there be a ton of civilizations right now and not in the past? That would have to be explained. And there's really no good explanation for that. Because there's no reason why an Earth-like planet with humans on it could have happened a billion years ago. There's no good explanation for why that would be, obviously from a scientific standpoint. Okay. I mean, there could very well be civilizations that have been around for a billion years. Okay. Now, if you go far enough back, there would be problems because you wouldn't have a lot of heavy elements and so on. But it's probably very likely that within maybe 5 billion years after the Big Bang, you could start having planets with with, with humans or, or aliens on them. So this seems to be an amazing coincidence if that there is another civilization out there and we have yet to meet them as a result of time. Because you would have to explain why for so long throughout the history of the universe this didn't happen. So it seems like a very weak argument, basically. Okay, any questions? All right. The last one of these is the UFO explanation. Now... I guess I don't have too much to say about it because you can, anything can pull anything out of their ass basically here. Um, but the basic idea is that the premise is wrong and that either aliens are here now, visit on a regular basis, or have been here in the past. Now, we can talk about that as much as you like, but... I think ultimately the issue is this. We're, you know, we're trying to do science here, okay? Not just tell some kind of story. So if we're talking about science, we need an observation. We need evidence. We need to be able to reproduce the observation. You be able to find more evidence. And that doesn't exist for UFOs. There's a lot of amazing stories of UFOs. 
has a lot of really weird observations. There's a lot of very strange stories and ancient things that require explanations. And um, I guess the problem is, is that if a lot of UFO stories are true, why are they so like shady, basically? Why don't they just say, hey, you know, instead of flying over Mexico City every few years and freaking people out, why don't they just land and say hi or something like that? Yeah, but if they have the ability to space travel, they could, they could, they could, I mean, either, either like, I mean, maybe they just have a twisted sense of humor or something. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just like a rogue group of like, maybe there's tons of aliens out there and nobody cares about us, but there's just like rogue prankster alien civilization. It's just like, let's just mess with the humans. So, question? Well, what are we, what are they farming from us? Oh, well, <laughs> Lucy. I mean, sure, yeah. Like, I mean, it's like a reality TV show. They're just watching us and laughing. So it's like a power trip, maybe, or yeah, I don't know. Theater. Well, okay, so let me let me make a statement about that. So that's a really creepy picture, huh? I mean, I try to get the creepiest picture I could find. <laughs> so um, I mean, there's ideas like. Humans are here because we were colonized by aliens and we're the, we're the ancestors of aliens. Um, that's weird because why would they just dump people here and then leave and not come back or not leave any clear signs? Um, so the idea that we could be descendants is kind of odd because you would think that they would impart some technology to us or maybe we're an experiment. Because, I mean, we would do that. I mean, for example, we're going to go to Europa and look for life. And if we don't find it there like microbial life, we might decide to implant it there and see what happens and go back later. I mean, maybe that happened right here. Anyway, but I do want to address what I will call the UFO phenomenon, okay? So there are two scenarios for UFOs. Either every single story is wrong. Every single UFO sighting, abduction story, all that stuff, everyone is wrong or there's some that are correct. Now, either explanation is very strange, right? Either scenario is weird. How could every single one of them be wrong? Because if every single one is wrong, what the hell is wrong with us? Why do we keep thinking we see them? Why do people claim abduction stories? Why does this happen? Yes. Well, I mean, you could link, you could lump that with a whole like religion argument. We just want to believe there's something else out there. So whether it's God or aliens or whatever, that could be part of that. But it is, there is something to this. It's really hard to believe that every single story is wrong. It's really hard to believe that. So the question becomes, what's going on? Is there something psychological with us where we want to believe or we're deluded into believing? I mean, whether you believe aliens, uh, UFOs, I'll say, certainly, are true or not, there's something to say about every single story being wrong. And that requires an extraordinary explanation because there are some crazy stories out there. I mean, there's this thing called the Disclosure Project. I don't know if anybody's heard of the Disclosure Project. The Disclosure Project is a group of people that are almost all, at some point in their lives, were government or military officials that give testimony to the fact that they know of alien civilizations, they know of technology, they know of things that have been captured by the government, and so on. And this is not just in America. This is in Canada, and this is in Europe. Why would high-ranking military officials lie? 
Maybe they're not. Maybe they're deluded. Why are they? Why are so many people deluded? I mean, it's just the whole phenomenon is fascinating because if it's all wrong, that's extraordinary. And if some of them are right, that means there's aliens. But it's if you really think about it, if every story is wrong, that says a lot about people. And and I mean, it's just very odd, right? It's just extremely odd. So anyway, so let me conclude this here. Um, now. When I ask people, do you think there's aliens out there? The number one response I typically hear is the top one up here. There are so many stars in the galaxy, there has to be something out there, okay? That statement is a uh, statistical fallacy, okay? Because there's, there's so many stars in the galaxy, in the universe, there has to be something out there. That is a fallacy, okay? now. What, that, what it says, let me boil down to this. There's a large sample size, so it has to be true, okay? There are people that play the lottery for 30 years, 40 years. They never won, okay? They'll tell you something about that fact right there. Large sample size means nothing, okay? The fallacy is this. A large sample size does not indicate the likelihood of an event. Just because something happens a lot doesn't mean it's going to happen, what determines if something's going to happen is the probability of that event. If something is going to happen, if something is one in a trillion to happen, and you do it a billion times, it's really unlikely to happen. But a billion times is a lot of times, isn't it? So you can't say that because there's a lot of stars, there has to be something out there. That is a totally invalid argument, okay? Because it does not take into account the factors that make life. Yes. Okay. But I really want you to understand that because it's a very common argument I hear, but it's fundamentally a flawed argument because it implies that just because there's a large sample, if something has to happen, then it's not how statistics works. Yes. That's pretty awful, huh? But that appears to be the case. It's not a nice thing to believe because guess what? We've done this many times. We were the center of the universe. We were the center of the solar system. For a while, we thought we were the center of the galaxy. We've done a lot of, yeah, yeah, narcissistic things. And so making a statement like that rings a lot of bells. Oh, my gosh, we're saying we're the only civilization in the universe. So making a statement like that, you have to step, take a step back and say this. We've, we've made these mistakes before. But, again, we're not doing this lightly. We're taking into account a lot of factors, and it does seem to point in that direction, yes. Okay, more importantly though, we don't know the factors that create life. That's the thing. You can have a large sample size, but if life is really unlikely to occur, it doesn't matter that you have 10 to the 22 galaxies because the likelihood when you really look at it is 10 to the 30. And the fact that we're even here is a statistical anomaly. Yeah. Well, here's the weird thing about that, though. The fact that we're able to even make that argument, the fact that we're able that we're here, it means the statistical anomaly must be true. Right. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a weird, it's kind of a deep argument, but the fact that maybe it's statistical anomaly that we're here and life is really unlikely, but we're here. So it happened. It's, it's a weird thing. Anyway, let's... Um, so, let's get through the rest of this here. Um, okay, if the basic arguments here are true, a lot of, there's a lot of money and time devoted to SETI, the search for extraterrestrial life, and a lot of farmers don't like SETI because they think it's a waste, okay, because of the, some of the things we said here. However, the original statement still stands. There are no intelligent extraterrestrials on Earth now or in the past, and we very may likely be alone. Now, that's not a nice thing to believe though because here's the thing there are two scenarios right the scenarios are we do live in a universe with other intelligent beings and we don't know about them yet that's a scary thought right we have yet to contact them we don't know why we haven't contacted them but that's a scary thought the other scenario is that we're alone and that is an equally scary thought 
either scenario is kind of scary, basically. So whether we're alone or whether we're, we have other intelligent civilizations. So the question sort of becomes, if we're likely here alone, then the question really is why we're here at all. And that's where science says, okay, I'll stop right here. Because again, everything I'm talking about here, these are scientific arguments. And um, you know, any good scientific argument would recognize the limitations. Science doesn't answer everything, right? There are a lot of other things to take into account. There's a lot of things that are not potentially observable things. Then you can get into philosophical arguments, religious arguments, and so on. And that's, this is where science stops. Yes. Okay, here's the problem with being alone. I will likely go home tonight and drink and play Fallout 4 and pass out on my couch. That's the best that the universe has to offer for a lot of us. That's what I'm going to do. And of all the work, the billions of years, okay, that evolution has happened and the, you know, the universe and stars created, and you look at what we produce, what, there's a lot of great things, but there's a lot of really crappy things. And we're the best that the universe has to offer, right? That's kind of like, wow, right? That makes you feel like maybe we should be, but then again, it's like, what value is that? The value just lies in whatever we value. So, so what? Maybe we don't have to live up to, we're trying to, I mean, I'm not saying we should live up to some unknown weird standard, but it's just funny because you look, if we're alone, you look at like, my wife watches uh, the Celebrity Big Brother show that was on a few months ago in the UK. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. These people are like the worst people in the world. And that's what we watch and we like it. And it's fun. I mean, it's funny. It's pathetic and horrible. <laughs> that's what we're doing. All right, anyway, uh, I'm going to end it here. But um, so...